Okay, thank you very much, Baruch, for, for, for such a generous, generous introduction. Uh, I must say, I, as a non-philosopher, I feel extremely humbled by being part of such a grand, uh, grand company. Uh, the last time I was in the Netherlands, and I think we even uh, had a couple of hours in, in The Hague, was back in 1986. I was 13, and my most vivid memory is walking off the, um, the roller coaster in the Efteling. I think I puked twice. Anyway, it's wonderful to be back in this, in this country. Um, so anyway, here we go. So I'll be talking about reason and unreason in contemporary business and, and management. Um, the performance cultures that prevail in many of today's business organizations are an odd mix of rationality and prophecy. While the optimization of profitability, sales, and other business goals is routinely managed through systematic measurement, continuous feedback schemes, and key performance indicators, it is difficult to imagine them without their visions, dreams, and desires. Or without CEO profits, eager to help employees reach their goals. In chapter two of the Theological Political Treatise, Spinoza famously defined a prophet as someone endowed with a more vivid power of imagination. Whether thus endowed or simply possessed by a relentless thirst for power and glory, business executives may be seen to habitually act as prophets who promise employees and consumers, investors and politicians that the future is wide open, that there are no limits and that as long as you do what it takes and give them what they need, the impossible is possible. In this talk, I'll try and illustrate this claim by sharing some examples from my ethnographic fieldwork in Swedish sportswear company Björn Borg. Now, as some of you may know, Björn Borg has a substantial presence here in the Netherlands, uh, actually dating back to 1993. You are Björn Borg's second largest market with 22% of total sales and around 50 people work at the main offices in, in Tilburg. Actually, uh, for those who may be interested, they're currently hiring for a key account manager to be based in Amsterdam. <laughs> this is their offices in, in Tilburg. Uh, but to leave no confusion, um, this is the man uh, behind the brand. I, I have no idea who the one on the right is. <laughs> Uh, this is their, their biggest seller, their biggest product. So they're known for underwear. Anyway, before proceeding, a caveat is in order. Even though I'm suggesting that there are certain theological and political forces at play within the Bjornborg organization and in contemporary business more broadly, I obviously suffered from a strike of hubris when I advertised my own talk as a theological political exercise. My ponderings here are, of course, light years apart from the careful textual analysis of scriptures prophecies, which Spinoza pioneered in his theological political treatise, not to speak of the naturalist explanations he put forward against miracles. However, Spinoza's first treatise even included a number of cultural and organizational observations about the Hebrew state, about its leadership and its ceremonies. Observations which may be relevant for how we can understand some of the things that are going on in business organizations today. Stretching it, one might even suggest that ethnographic fieldwork in a corporate performance culture makes it possible to understand how their quasi-scriptural principles are revealed in practice. Let me try and flesh this out by talking about the peculiar mix of reason and unreason which I have observed at Björn Borg during my 18 months of fieldwork between August 2016 and January 2018. In many ways, this company is just like any other company with an explicit performance culture. They have strategic goals and ambitious stretch targets that are expressed through key performance indicators, otherwise known as KPIs. Employee performance is measured, assessed, and evaluated continuously through feedback systems and regular appraisal reviews. They call their, their goals SMART. That is specific, measurable, attractive, relevant, and timely. <laughs> More specifically, Bjornborg operates according to the following four KPIs. Sell through, which is basically the rate of product sold to customers at full price. 
employee engagement, total sales, and EBIT, which, as you may know, means earnings before interest and tax. So this is basically how they measure their operating profits. The company had very little of this before current CEO Henrik Bunger was brought in five years ago to turn around a company that had lost its brand identity and <laughs> suffered from poor financial results. Now, which perhaps this is a reminder that when things go wrong, people will seek guidance from anyone. <laughs> Bunger immediately launched a five-year strategic plan aiming to reinvent Björnborg as a premium brand in sports fashion. Indeed, the strategic vision is to be the number one sports fashion brand for people who want to feel active and attractive. To get there, by 2019, the end of this year, they were determined to strive for a sell-through rate of 70%, get an employee engagement level of 90%, double sales, double total sales, to one billion Swedish kroner, which is nearly, well, with with, with, with the current rates, approximately 100 million euros, and reach a 15% profit margin. This is uh, their way of doing sports fashion. Now, I guess I should offer some context to this. According to CEO Bunge, employee engagement has never before been measured at 90%, not anywhere in the world. Björnborg's own score increased from 72% in 2015 to 78% in 2018. Uh, secondly, sportswear giant Adidas, where Bung actually used to work, he was, he was um, head of sales for, for, their, for their Nordic operations. <laughs> Adidas had an operating profit margin at 8.55% in March 2014. <laughs> um, June this, this year, they, they had reached 11.26%. Bjorn Borg's operating profit margin was 10.4% in 2014, and, and it actually remained at 10% in 2018. So, you know, 15% is quite, it's quite a, a high, high target to set for a company like this. Actual sell through rates are treated as, as business secrets. So, so I, I don't really have any industry level uh, statistics on this, but according to a good friend of mine, who's been a manager in Swedish fashion retail uh, since the mid nineties, it is extremely difficult to get beyond 55%. Actually, Björn Borg's self roof target had to be temporarily reduced to 45% in 2017 because the 70% 70, 70 target was undermining sales. I mean, you know, you, you can easily reach a 100% uh, percent, um, sell-through target just by, you know, selling one, one product at, at um, full price to one person. Anyway, <laughs> uh, but of course that won't make your, your total sales very, very high. While there is nothing extraordinary about Björnborg's performance management framework as such, there is more to suggest that they do things the wrong way. They want to get better and greener. The CEO replaced his Mercedes with a Tesla shortly after I joined. Uh, but they also want to get stronger. Indeed, the CEO arrived at Björnborg with an assumption that physically fit employees perform better at work. In other words, that fitness drives corporate performance. One of the first things he did was therefore to introduce a compulsory sports hour. So every Friday at 11 a.m., they closed the office for an hour to go to the gym and work out together. This is from, from, their, from their, uh, sp one of their sports hours here, uh, an image which used to be on the website. Uh, it's a few years old, but and I'm not sure uh, if this is before the sports hour or after. I mean, they do seem very happy, don't they? But I'm not sure if they are particularly joyful. I don't know. We'll get to that later. <clears throat> Other performance coaches have organisational goals, team goals and individual goals. At Björn Borg, staff have fitness goals on top of this. And many of them work out several times a week to reach their goals. The CEO works out twice a day. To measure goal achievements, employees undergo compulsory fitness tests twice a year. Fitness is calculated in terms of physical age. In 2016, 
Their average chronological age was 35, but their average physical age was 29. Two years later, the average chronological age had increased to 36, but their average physical age had dropped to 26. The CEO, who is my age, 46, has a physical age, uh, uh, yeah, has a chronological age of 26, his, uh, of 46, sorry. His physical age is 21, which is the optimal. You don't want to get any, any younger than 21 because, you know, then you are not fully matured. Um, so, based on this, you may not be surprised that, that they explicitly recruit new staff who fit the bill of being strong and sporty. Now, if you're interested in working for them in Sweden rather than in the Netherlands, they currently have three full-time openings, including one for a super strong and creative global visual merchandising manager. We spoke of, of, of poisonous images earlier, didn't we? Um, still, management does not take it for granted that you'll reach your goals, even if you appear to be an ideal Björnborg employee. As for a more as there is more emphasis on working smart than working long hours, new hires undergo a compulsory training program where they are told how to prioritize and how to optimize their day. Staying focused on the job is central, so distractions from emailing and text messaging must be minimized. Sounds good, right? Uh, to maintain momentum, staff are encouraged to work in sprints. That is 25 minute intervals followed by five minute breaks. I'm not sure if anybody here have, have tried to, to, uh, to work in sprints. Uh, there are several apps available, one called Pomodoro, inspired by or alluding to the, to the recipe of, 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 uh, of um, Pomodoro sauce, which apparently takes uh, 25 minutes to, to reach its perfect consistency. So that's where part of this comes from. Anyway, they're also encouraged to participate in the many activities that are offered to help staff manage performance. Feedback training, presentation skills workshops, leadership training, stress management workshops, meditation sessions, and workshops on sleep. Another key activity is the company's mandatory Monday meetings. Every Monday at, at nine o'clock, they, uh, um, they gather in the, in the kitchen. So, on these meetings, team leaders report weekly performance figures, but also um, a new recent hire is picked out each week to go through the five questions that make up the Björnborg performance framework. The Björnborg novice who has learned the framework by heart will know that the first question they're supposed to ask is not where are we, but where are we going? During the first meeting I attended in September 2016, the novice in question got the two mixed up, but was held out by the CEO. If you don't know where we're going, we don't know where we are. This was followed by a unison response as all 60 staff in the room virtually shouted out the company's performance targets and the core values. Passion, winning attitude, multiplying. Mind you, this year, multiplying, which nobody really quite understood anyway, was replaced by empowering, bold, and magnetic. <laughs> Soon thereafter, a unison response answered the fifth and final question. Why do we do this? To make a difference. Now, I mentioned the vision earlier. This is the corporate mission. But perhaps more than anything, these Monday meetings are like pep talk ceremonies where the CEO gets to shine. Sharing personal stories and revelations, dressing up as Björnborg himself, and interrupting staff with comments and corrections. As he said at the end of the first meeting I attended, I'm here to motivate you and help you reach your goals. Indeed, CEO Bunger defines motivation as goals plus desire. In his view, there's no point having goals if you don't want to reach them. Not sure if you can see this very well, uh, but in the middle there, he's wearing, you know, the characteristic headband and, and a wig and the tennis racket. Yeah. He's wearing a wig. Yeah, he's actually wearing a wig. Yeah, because he he he, he goes to the hairdressers quite quite often. Yeah. Uh, 
Anyway, uh, yeah, I need to do something about that photo. Anyway, um, the dreams and designs of this performance culture are further communicated to staff through frequent mentioning of self help mantras. Impossible is nothing. If it's easy, it ain't worth it. Who wouldn't want to become a better version of themselves? Now, I reckon a post Marxist could have a ball with this libid libidinal economy. But um, I guess I'd better try and say something about Spinoza. In the theological political treatise, Spinoza helped readers see through the revelations preached by prophets, remarking that prophets are private individuals who have their own bodily temperaments, beliefs, and interests. At Bjornborg, the CEO's private passion for fitness has not just become a corporate value, but a rule. Since he loves working out, everybody has to. And even though his revelation doesn't merely teach him how to live well, I suspect that it teaches us less than he believes about how to manage performance. According to Spinoza, prophecy must be removed from the realm of truth and put in its proper place, which is theology. At Björn Borg, the assumed performance benefits of physical fitness are treated as universal truths. Yet, there is very little evidence that organizations with physically fit employees actually perform better. Spinoza might have called this truth claim an inadequate idea, and he might have called the company's unrealistic wall, uh, goals imaginations, <coughs> and viewed them both as part of an unreasonable belief system. But are they miracles in the making? However miraculous all this may sound, at Bjornborg, extraordinary performance is not the work of God, but imagined as a result of passion, winning attitude, and excellent work practices. When short of reasonable scientific evidence, CEO Bunger resorts to a mix of superstition and hopeful reasoning. If we hadn't set our goals this high, we wouldn't even come close to where we are now. That's a typical defense. So is CEO Bunger a prophet? He certainly is a passionate, ambitious, and some might say charismatic leader with a strong sense of purpose and relentless drive to define dreams and inspire employees to reach for them. Doing so, he helps employees cultivate an enthusiastic obedience to the ends and means of corporate, individual, and physical performance. Like Moses, I suppose, but not like Moses, of course, he teaches people a way of life under the law. Yet, like the opposite, the, the, but like, like the apostles, but not like the apostles. Sorry, that was a difficult word, word to say. He, he readily teaches his performance framework to anyone who cares to listen. His dream is to have a global sports hour compulsory for everybody in the world. CEO Bunge told me that outsiders sometimes call Björn Borg a sect. Spinoza, who was accused of Leibniz to lead a, a stoic sect, noted that ceremonies are important to sects, and that sects are inevitable when people are driven by superstition. He also noted that, is, that it is the inability of sects to distinguish God's teaching, teachings from human beliefs and fabrication which makes sects teach so many contradictory beliefs. But if adopting a more modern definition, perhaps along the lines of Max Weber and Roy Wallace, I find it difficult to classify Bayern Borg as a sect. Sure, their staff do seem to have a strong sense of purpose, if not a calling. The organization does things their own way. Recruitment is selective and exclusive. Those who don't fit in, they quit. But uh, while most staff are highly devoted, it would be a stretch to suggest that the devotion comes from individual revelation. It would also be a stretch to suggest that the combination of commitment and obedience takes the form of total submission and control. And while the company sometimes celebrates the losses and failures of corporate rivals, they do not isolate themselves from society. Finally, former employees are not punished or ostracized and interaction between current and former employees is not prohibited. My conclusion is therefore that they are not a sect, even though they sometimes hold fitness ceremonies in churches. This is from this country actually, earlier this year, um, August, September, I need to check the date, but this is 
These are, uh, this is the, the, um, the Holland team uh, working out in Church de Doif in Amsterdam. How, how, how do we say that? Okay, okay, yeah. So you know, you know the one I'm talking about. Yeah. Is, this, is this a very, very famous or, or, or important uh, church building? Yeah, and it's still used by the church. Hmm. Right, wow. I wonder how they, I'd be interested to find how, how they, how they uh, managed to work their <laughs> way in there. Anyway, so what then is it that attracts people to such organisations and to their leaders? Spinoza argued that those with a desire for things uncertain are prone to superstition, and that superstition may be exploited by the crafty and ambitious. But I'm not convinced that Bjornborg staff buy into the culture simply because they are superstitious common people easily led by prophets and visionaries. Rather, perhaps, like most of us, they, they seem to be led by their passions. Not just by sound passions, but also by apparently joyful affects, which shape their relationships to themselves and to others. Who wouldn't want to be, become stronger, smarter, and greener, bolder, and more sociable. Who wouldn't want to become a better version of themselves? Björnborg management knows that people have these strengths and weaknesses, and they exploit them. Employees I talked to uh, told me it's, it's a great place to work because, you know, they have fun, they feel, and they feel great working out. We even get paid to work out, they say. And me, you know, arriving there as a bit of a couch potato, I, 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 I realised that, you know, I felt a lot better working out with them. Even though, you know, first time I, I went to the sports hour, I strained my knee. So, you know, I went, I came out of that sports hour limping. But, you know, I feel physically, at least, uh, better. So, it is seductive. It is seductive. Uh, they also appreciate the sense of control that comes with having specific goals and targets. Then at least one of them said, I know what's expected. Before we had these goals, you know, it was all a muddle. While this mix of sad and joyful affects makes it difficult to resist and to leave, people have left. Um, actually, well, the, 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 the official staff turnover rates, they, they, they vary, but I figured out that uh, during the first couple of years, only 12, 13 out of about 60, 65 staff stayed yeah, with, with the change in management. And people continue to leave. So, you know, some of them are only there for a few months. Um, okay, where was I? Yeah, so people have left. Uh, but I guess, you know, some, some have left because their dreams and hopes were crushed. And some have left because they've come to think that it may be better to work somewhere else. Now, does this, though, make Bjorn Borg any worse than other companies? They're certainly not the only company that exploits this conflation of sad and joyful affects. Take Facebook, for example, which score high in student rankings of attractive employers, and which is managed under the ostensibly caring leadership of CEO Mark Zuckerberg and CEO, COO Sheryl Sandberg. I don't want to, to relieve Zuckerberg of any, any responsibility here, but how do you find joy, as Sandberg puts, her, puts it in her, in her book, Option B, when you are a big sift when you basically are a big sister working for a big brother whose business model, perhaps more than anyone's, is based on watching us and milking our affects and relationships for what they're worth. Indeed, why should more people lean in, as she argued in the previous book with the same title, to pursue leadership positions, when leadership positions are such risk undermining rather than enhancing other people's joy, their capacity to think and act? However much leaders say they care, leaders rarely miss an opportunity to impose their own authority on others, to tell them what's best for them, remind them who knows best, and remind them who is boss. 
All this doesn't give me a great deal of hope that a more reasonable organization of work, business and social life is possible. Not under capitalism, at least not, at least not as we know it. Of course, deep down, I know it's, it's an oxymoron, all this. Um, but despite its unreasonableness, I'm not quite ready to treat this world of business as a world of, on its own and separate it from the realm of reason. I guess what I'm trying to say is that it's worth learning about organizations like Björn Borg, like Facebook, or universities for that matter, because so many of us are becoming obedient subjects of their cult of performance and leadership. Much thanks to the confusion of reason and unreason, many of us are enthralled by the idea of becoming leaders ourselves. And we are enthralled by the image of ourselves as leaders. But faced with growing authoritarianism, separatism, willful ignorance and plain stupidity, I don't think we need more leaders. Spinoza, as you know, reminds us that it is often the least fit, indeed the most greedy and ambitious, who become leaders. And I suppose Plato made a similar point in the, in the Republic. Uh, so, while there is something particularly troubling with the dreams, goals, and leadership of corporate performance culture, uh, I'm not sure it's by pursuing leadership positions that we may help cultivate a society where people are free to think what they wish, say what they think, and act reasonably and together for the collective freedom and welfare of all. Getting more people to assume leadership positions would simply continue to turn others into obedient followers, ruled perhaps not by the same dreams, but by our dreams. Okay, that's it. Surprise ending. Um, okay, thank you very much. Talk it. A refreshing view into uh, into the factory where we, which we all depend on for our uh, for our clothes at least. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, those conditions uh, are, uh, are have been uh, historically suboptimal as long as we've had them. Right? Uh, don't think there's ever been a period of human civilization where production has been organized in a non-exploitative way. So the challenge is still. Uh, uh, the same one that was uh, uh, current at, at Spinoza's time. Yeah, I, uh, you raise a lot of r really interesting points, especially that idea that, that uh, performance indicators may be not about how we perform, but how we conform, right? That we, uh, that uh, they're not, uh, they're, they're so stringent and they're so arbitrary that, um, um, that uh, they, they cannot be applied generally. They are only for a very instrumental notion of activity. So, um, and this, this is something that, I don't know, some, can we say that uh, Spinozan joy can be exploited itself, that uh, this, this, this uh, uh, joy of achieving things or being recognized of achieving certain performance targets or conformance targets um, is just instrumentalized uh, for uh, uh, extracting uh, value in the, in the, from, from productive activities. Um, so there's no real emancipatory, although it does feel emancipatory, perhaps, right? There's an emancipatory within the exploitative uh, realm. And I think that's something that we all kind of struggle with to some extent, that, uh, that you, know, you know, even our, our critical uh, propositions here or elsewhere will be subsumed into uh, uh, a dynamic of intellectual capitalism which will uh, extract value from it and denature the uh, revolutionary potential. So I don't actually have a question, <laughs> but uh, there's a few uh, thoughts that I had to respond. I mean, thanks for this smart, smart talk. Uh, 
I mean, on one hand, I think it's just the, you raise the question, what is the better gym? I mean, do we have an, another offer than the capitalist gymnastic of make a difference, be stronger, be more, kind of the entire leadership uh, madness? Um, but that is something I also wanted to um, tackle earlier, that within capitalist society, maybe we are now coming uh, at a certain transformative threshold that this kind of company culture, I think it's maybe still increasing, but on the other hand, we also have new ideas of discipline and of a certain kind of Protestant uh, ethics within comp uh, company cultures. But nevertheless, I think the question that you are raising is how, I mean, within that performativity of joy, there has to be a certain dialectical twist. And I think this is also what Spinoza is kind of uh, uh, asking us. Where is the twist within, uh, we spoke about earlier, the, the logics of similarity? Because at the end, I think Spinoza says, when we go into that circle of affect imitation, no? that is gymnastics, affect imitation, and the joy about the joy of the other, the love about the love of the other. And it's always also ambition for glory, for narcissism, and so on, and, and so on. Uh, but Spinoza is materialist and realist enough to say, I don't find ambition for glory. I don't find narcissism. It's not about altruist cultures. It's about ego altruism. So we have to organize something, how we can kind of twist the logic against itself. And that will be my, my question uh, uh, for you. How can we, against maybe a conservative interpretation of company cultures, like Adam Curtis, I think everyone knows, the century of the self, 1968 struggles, like that was all narcissistic, minoritarian struggle, which lead now to consumerism, capitalism, capitalism of difference. Is there a certain militancy within the performativity of joy that makes a difference to the capitalist performativity of joy that you very wonderfully uh, kind of brought on, on the table. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I guess, you know, can you take the microphone? Yeah. Uh, uh, there's one thing I, I wanted to comment on, but, but it slipped my mind. Uh, but, but, but yeah, I guess, you know, um, the Speaking of the, the the Protestant work ethic, you know, I think it, it's becoming increasingly difficult to see, you know, the fruits of our labour at work. But the gym here uh, provides us with a way to 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 have sort of e immediate, pretty much immediate positive uh, reinforcement of ourselves and our egos. But the other thing, I guess, which makes this so difficult um, to resist is that, you know, it's not just about the ego because you're given, uh, they, they create this context when you are supposed to be, you're, you're part of something of a higher purpose. Uh, they don't pay particularly well, but they promise that you'll be part of something great, something truly amazing, reaching those goals, you know, and that will, at the end of the day, make you more attractive, sure, to other employers, but, you know, that's part of how they sell it in. The notion of multiplying was actually quite interesting, because that basically was translated as, we're better together, right? But, of course, in practice, it was, <laughs> you know, uh, really, you know, the, the egotistic, uh, individualistic, narcissistic careerism, which was, which was, which was, uh, uh, which was performed. So it was difficult to get, to get people to, to, to practice, you know, uh, the notion of, the notion of multiplying. Um, another question I, um, Baruch, you, 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 you mentioned that, you know, the sense in which this is a corruption of of joy, or, or that's that, that's certainly how 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 you made me uh, think of it. Uh, again, I think what what can can this even be joyful? I mean, of course, the the management there they assume that they know the causes behind performance, winning attitude, going to the gym, working smart, 
and, and, and having excellent work practices. You know, they assume this, but I suppose you know <laughs> these are these are inadequate courses, if you like. There's an inadequate sense of of causality. Mm -hmm. So if if they don't truly know the causes behind the performance, you know, can they ever find joy? Maybe I'm exaggerating, maybe I'm constructing joy into some kind of, you know, uh, total, total concept here, which, 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 um, which it perhaps never can be, but um, anyway. Um, <coughs> yeah, I think I had a question uh, for you about individualization of the motivational things. Mm -hmm. uh, whether uh, it, it comes from a particular Spinozistic place. I was, a I was a little surprised that you didn't mention what Spinoza has to say about doctrines of faith. Mm -hmm. uh, you told, told, spoke mostly about miracles and about prophecies and, mm -hmm. and things like that. Whereas what, what, what he has to say about how doctrines of faith, like he has in the chapter 14, uh, these universal doctrines of faith, which is supposed to be sort of a, a common notion of universal faith that everybody should agree upon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and how those doctrines of faith motivate people to behave in a particular kind of way. In this case, to behave charitably and yeah. with justice, but that could be anything. It could be towards performance or whatever. If you have a set of doctrines, uh, speculative doctrines, they will motivate you toward something. Now, at the same time, Spinoza also has an analysis of, uh, on the one hand, you have these shared doctrines that will motivate you, but then also you have individualized say, out in different types of religious sects, which all will fall under uh, this, this, this universal faith, as it were, uh, but which are individualized according to the mentality of each people or each community or each person, um, and, and which adds, mostly ceremonies, I guess, and which adds uh, to, uh, because let's say the core doctrines will often, let's say, uh, the core doctrines say, God exists, uh, there's only one of them. It's not enough to motivate people. So you need something else, you need some, some narratives, individualized narratives for each person that will motivate them to behave in a particular way. Now within a corporate structure like that, will they do the same thing? Uh, is, is, is these, say, mo these doctrines that they all, these ceremonies that they share, uh, that's one thing, but do they also have individualized things, as it were, so that this part of, you know, of the enterprise or, or of the corporate uh, they will do this and the others will do this and they will have different kinds of motivation for different sectors of the corporation. Yeah, I mean, as I, as I mentioned, the organization, they have their own, you know, corporate goals, of course, uh, expressed through their key performance indicators. But of course, each team have their own goals and targets and each individual have their own goals, goals and targets, right? Job-specific goals, personal goals and fitness goals and even you know ecological goals you know live more ecologically um, so and I guess it's it's the the individualized goals which really makes this so seductive right if the company well they might not pay you very well but they 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 train you so well that you will, through being part of this, you will build the kind of skills and knowledge which will make you, which will enhance your attractivity in the, in the labor market for, 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 well, management positions, then, you know, why not? I mean, if you come in there with, with very, uh, perhaps without higher education, you come in at a, at a ground level position, but you can still go and, you know, uh, learn to become a leader. You know, many people find that quite a, quite a good deal. So that's the individualization, I suppose. Hmm. So thank you very much. This was really, really interesting. And just to start, a suggestion that I would re really like to see developed, I don't know, whether you have an interest is to apply this kind of research to universities or whether you already <coughs> applied it. And I think maybe the Netherlands would be a good example because they are transitioning to an increasingly more business-like model. Mm -hmm. So a kind of smooth way 
but nonetheless very interesting. So this is just curiosity. So, but more about Spinoza. So I, I was very much interested by your discussion about goals-oriented practices. And of course, goals in business seems to be the god there, right? But then I was wondering whether Spinoza could actually offer some antidotes or to downplay this. And I have at least two suggestions, and maybe you may react on that. So the first is that if you think about, if we think about how Spinoza conceives of power, so of course there is a, a dynamic dimension of power which can increase or decrease, but this is related to the fact that something is more or less successful in just persevering in its own being. So there is no becoming something else. Actually, your power is increased when you do not become something else. If you become something else, you destroy it, right? So, and in that sense, it's, it's not achieving anything, right? It's the opposite of achieving something. And you can see that also mirrored in his kind of anthropological, psychological deconstruction of the idea of goals and how they played in shaping superstition. I'm thinking, of course, of the appendix to the first part of the ethics, where the desire to uh, think that you can live in a world that is designed for you, let you think that nature is organized in such a way and then has to fit your, your own goals, right? And of course, this is the wrong way of thinking. So, and again, I think what I have my intuition is, again, we're bumping into this idea if there is a form of kind of conservatism or being conservative in a way that can be constructive, despite the fact that our conditioning is saying that conservatives has to be bad, but maybe there is another way of thinking about that. And so really, maybe you have some thoughts about these two issues. So. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I guess you know I'm I'm, I'm as disillusioned as, as anybody uh, about the the potential for 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 you know collective uh, collective jo um, joyful action within this realm. Um, but again, you know, speaking to your your point about power, um, what I. I'm observing in, in companies like this, you know, it's again, it's sure, it's it's the conflation of sad and joyful affects, but it's also the conflation of uh, two different kinds of power. Uh, the the, the uh, capacity enhancing power, as you mentioned, but also the authoritarian forms of power, the potentia and the potestas. Um, and I guess, you know, when, when, they, when they ask you, you know, would you like to become a better version of yourself? Uh, the transformational potential there is, you know, it's limited because we're still talking about you. You will still, you know, walk, walk out of there yourself, only a better version of yourself. Um, but I guess, you know, what, what, they are, what they are using, and this is perhaps what makes them at least partly unique is that they're combining, you know, combining these appeals to freedom and dynamic um, power with authoritarian power. Because, you know, there are all these rules about what you need to do. Sports hour is not voluntary. You need to do it, you know. Uh, your goals, I mean, some organizations, you know, people make up their own goals entirely. But, you know, here, they are, they are uh, systematically checked against your team manager, against the overarching corporate goals, and, 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 and so on. So it's that mix which, which makes it, yeah, it's not quite capitalism on cocaine. It's, it, it's sort of a, a tempered form of, of capitalism. And, you know, <laughs> Deleuze, Gotari, they famously said, you know, uh, that would say that, that capitalism would try and invent all sorts of things to try and save it from itself. And I guess that's part of what they're doing here.
Um, yeah, well, just because Andrea mentioned universities, I, I guess I was sort of thinking about the same thing when you were speaking. And, um, you know, as a head of department, I already have to deal with KPIs. I deal with smart objectives. That's just part of the air we breathe now. Um, every member of staff in my unit has to set annual objectives that they have to then show how they've met towards the end of the year. So, um, and I think in universities, we, um, we sort of go along with this stuff while not believing in it. Um, we, we understand that this is the language we need to speak and the th boxes we need to tick just in order to sort of get through the day and the year. Um, none of us believe in it. Most of us think it's nonsense. Um, so I suppose it strikes me that there's something interesting spinazistically going on there as well, where <laughs> a, a number of us who, who spend at least, you know, 20 or 30 percent of our time trying to think rationally about philosophical issues or whatever it is that we do, um, also spend 20 or 30 percent of our time kind of buying into a very corporatized um, sort of language and set of values, even, even though we know it's an imaginary, you know, we know that it's a, it's a kind of way of imagining reality, which, which is uh, very inadequate. Um, I, I don't know, it's not really a question, it's more just a sort of observation about university life. Maybe you feel the same. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, a, a friend of mine, uh, Mike Marinetto, he published a piece in the Times Higher uh, earlier this year about the hypocrisy in sort of in the critical, um, amongst the critical uh, academics in, in my field of, of management studies and business studies, you know, people who critique, who have developed, you know, quite systematic critiques on neoliberal management, but of course, who, who, who routinely uh, and willingly um, reinforce it by, by, you know, complying and committing to the, to the performance standards of, of the research uh, excellence framework in, in, in the UK. So, you know, there's, there's, a, there's, a <laughs> there's not a, a, um, um, a deficit of, of hypocrisy about, certainly not in, in, in my field of critical management studies. But, so I guess, you know, why do we keep, you know, we, we I can understand why we, on an individual level, might need to, you know, um, comply with these goals and practices to survive within the system. But still, I mean, we, we're just going to keep reinforcing that system unless we find collective ways of, um, of working, which, which might, might, might challenge those forms of working, right? Yeah, it's uh, it's very interesting to ima to think about whether you know uh, where where Spinoza belongs because of course like a deep philosophical engagement in any case we were talking about it on the way on the on the walk is is uh, is something that is not productive and not necessarily productive in in a direct way that cannot be measured in in terms of performance indica indicators it's something that's considered in in the software industry uh, network effects or or a positive externality, some things that just emerge just because we feel better or we are connecting with each other or we are uh, understanding things more satisfactorily. So it's, uh, it, 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 we see that, that, uh, that uh, with the neoliberalization of the university that uh, the humanities have less and less of a place in, in in, its, in their radical sense, in the sense of just asking the difficult questions and the casting uh, radical doubt on, on our conditions, like Spinoza did at his time. I mean, Spinoza, you don't think he was a... Uh, <laughs> I think uh, um, that's one of the things that got him in trouble is that he, he was uh, at least looking at uh, uh, the condition of his time in a very unvarnished and unsentimental way kind of stripping away the pretenses of, of, uh, of being good and being on the right path. And those kind of questions maybe don't really have a place in the, um, in the neoliberal academy. We have a question from the, a response from the audience, so please. Yes, thank you. Um, firstly, I am very much uh, fascinated by the fact that you chose to use ethnographic, uh, the ethnographic route for um, researching this, which I think is extremely fascinating in and of itself. 
Um, but I'm actually going to hope that you'll indulge me in um, something else that you've written in one of your articles about um, bodies or about bodies. Um, my question has to do with a statement that you made. Um, at the same time, Spinoza's ethics are um, or sit well with the argument for a diverse organization. So that's the way you started this off. And I'm very curious because um, that looks very homogeneous to me, at least from here. And I would like to know more about what you were saying here because I think it's um, quite interesting uh, that there might be some ideas that come out of Spinoza's ethics that can help us um, build more diverse organizations. Um, and then even as I'm asking you that, I feel as an academic myself that I need to like say something about the last conversation, which was um, I, I completely think that the adoption of the different SMART goals and the things that we use here in the Netherlands and almost every single um, university I've been here is based on our idea that somehow the corporate world is doing things better than us and therefore we have to copy their model. And I just wonder, is there another way to approach it? Is there a way to think about our own model for how we want to actually uh, measure how we do our work? because in fact it doesn't always work well that you're adopting something from something different that's built on a different idea. So, a little comment and question to that. Thank you. Do you have a, do you have a response? Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Um, I guess, you know, maybe, maybe I was a bit too hopeful when I said that, that you know, it sits well with diversity. Uh, maybe, you know, what we're seeing in many com companies is, is that uh, the whole notion of diversity is, is, is being given a very restrictive and limited um, sense. In this company, as, as you point out, you know, they look very, very homogenous. Uh, but at the same time, you know, they have they have quite a um, quite a sharp um, diversity management uh, plan. So again, you know, well, I guess this is always the problem that that you know intentions and plans they don't always translate into practice. And of course, a lot of these plans they're just done for for show, window dressing, right? Um, what I was trying to, to, to say with Spinoza, I suppose, is, you know, uh, just simply that, that what I take away from, 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 from some of his, some of his, his, his uh, teachings, that, that you know, we, we, we don't enhance our, not even ourselves, by just uh, connecting with and interacting with, pe with people who are like ourselves. More of the same will just create more of the same. And, and, and nothing will be, be, be enhanced qualitatively, simply um, magnified quantitatively. So I'm not sure if that answered your question, but. Yeah, <laughs> um, I just wonder about this picture. Um, I, th I think this picture is not by the, the company. I think it's from somebody else. And what I like about the picture is that actually the people who cannot keep up, they are in, in the back, but in the picture they are in the front. So maybe I would like to have a picture like that in my sports, in my gym, because then I would be able to relate to those who cannot keep up. But I just wondered, is it a picture that the CEO would like, or do you think not so much? Would, would he see also that maybe it's not such an ideal and maybe it's just, it's more of an antidote to the idea of becoming the same uh, or getting the same kind of body? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, this is, this is on their website. So, so this is corporate. This is co part of the part of corporate branding, employer branding, very much so. So, um, so I, I do think he, you know he very much, <laughs> he very much um, uh, endorses this. And and the company they did similar similar things in in, in various well in, in a number of countries, um, and they did so to music. I think especially composed music even by a Swede, I think a Swedish
composer. And what they were trying to show was that they were trying to flesh out, illustrate um, recent scientific, well, recent medical uh, research findings that, that uh, uh, suggest that our performance, even our physical performance, uh, is, is, is enhanced by 15% if we work out to music. So we'll, you know, put, put in, we'll work out extra, well, 15% harder if we do so to music. So that's what they did here. <laughs> Can I make a comment? Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I've been working the last 20 years in sports and uh, fashion companies like this. Thank you. And I've studied management and organization. I 100% recognize the story that you have shown here. These are very special companies. The one thing that, uh, that made uh, what, what I th thought was very interesting that uh, uh, people were talking about uh, uh, capitalist, capitalist uh, way of, of, of organizations. I think these kind of companies consider themselves to be on the complete other side. They will probably feel that they are the most socialist kind of companies. And that's very interesting to see how we perceive things in a different way than probably the people themselves. I've actually been employed by such companies and now I'm a a uh, 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 freelance uh, person already 20 years of this. I see it, I recognize it, it's very interesting. Thank you very much. I, I think that's uh, something that we do discover. I mean, that's what Bernie Sanders uh, complains, that we have uh, socialism for the rich uh, <laughs> today, and that uh, they should get off uh, welfare. Uh, that's uh, uh, subsidizing their uh, cheap um, uh, rent, uh, cheap uh, salaries that they pay their, their workers. Yeah. All right, well, we're at three o'clock, so we're going to be back on schedule if we stop now. So, uh, uh, and uh, maybe everybody needs to uh, get up. You know, I heard that it's, uh, it's good for you to move around, and uh, uh, <laughs> so we're going we're gonna to get some coffee and uh, we'll assemble back here in 30 minutes at 3.30. Yeah? Thank you very much, Tolkien.